Hello and welcome once again to our LeaderCast series. My name is Charles Galenik. I'm the Dean of the Executive MBA. Today we have with us the global head of HR from Unilever, Mr. Sandy Oak. Sandy, welcome to INSEAD. Thank you. One of the, the things that I think leadership research is, is correctly uh, uh, lambasted for and criticized is that we have a whole stream of leadership characteristics and traits, you know, endless, dozens of them that supposedly make for effective, effective leaders. Hmm. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it's hard for any individual to be all these things or for all these things to matter to a single organization, even one as large as uh, Unilever. Could you refine for us what are two or three uh, essential leadership characteristics at, at Unilever for people really to get ahead and to make an impact? Uh, what sort of things do you really look for? Well, it's a, it, it's a great and, and a very relevant question for us right now because, as you know, we've been going through a major change over the past several years. And it has involved uh, a change in the way we think about strategy, change in the organization structure, a change in the operating framework. So it's a fun, very fundamental uh, change. And one of the things that we considered was if the change is going to be effective, what kind of behaviors do we need in the leaders in, in order to enable to make, that happen. Uh, to make, to make it happen? If I, can, if I can back up just a little bit, Sandy, for, for our audience, uh, what's happened at Unilever is, is you've uh, centralized, maybe that's a dirty word, but you've, you've pulled some of the autonomy. It was a highly hyper-autonomous organization in the past. And for good business reasons, you've pulled some of this uh, back to a, a global level. And so this is the context now that we're dealing with. This is the, the, the leadership requirements uh, are created by this context. Exactly, exactly. And so if you have a set of leaders who have been used to, to operating um, in an independent, autonomous kind of fashion, and now we need them to play as part of a team in an interdependent uh, organization, that requires some different behaviors. So for us, a competency model just wasn't going to work, uh, at least the way we saw it. So we said, what are the behavior changes that are required in order for us to be successful? And so some of the things that we're really paying attention to um, is teamwork, team alignment, you know, being willing to uh, sacrifice local interests for the interests of the larger uh, entity. Key for our organization at this time. Another one for us is action rather than debate. Because we have tended to debate anything that was global. There was always a big debate about whether we were, somebody was going to do it locally. And in the past, they had the autonomy to be able to say, no, I'm not going to do it. So we had to debate and, and therefore sell uh, a lot to each other. And we wanted to reduce the selling time and reduce the debate and, and get more action and therefore more speed. Um, and um, another thing which has been in, always important in Unilever and continues to be important is talent. And we have had a strong history and heritage in management development and we have just had to step that up. And so building superior talent is one of the, thing, one of the other things that we that are, is really important to us. Okay, and on, on that note, um, there's often talk these days about talent wars, so-called uh, yeah. talent wars. And when I think of Unilever, I think of a, a massive global company, uh, certainly a very popular branded company, lots of famous brands that we all, we all know and use. Uh, but even as a company itself, it, it is a brand, in the business community at least, everybody knows about Unilever. Hmm. Um, you wouldn't think that Unilever would have uh, a lot of concern over a war for talent. Uh, my perceptions would have been that there's a lot of people at the door uh, waiting to become part of Unilever. Do you have any problems with uh, attrition? Do you face a war for talent? Uh, how, how sharp is it uh, within Unilever? Well, um, it, for us, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, it, it, and it's different in different parts of the world. And so if you if you, if you think about our, or the way we like to think about our markets, is that we have some markets, and this goes right back to the autonomous history. We have certain markets that have amazing talent machines. We are a premier employer in about 40 markets around the world. Now, unfortunately, we have other markets where 
the talent machine has never really been built. And so I characterize our, our major markets, and major meaning they're either very big now or they're going to need to be very big for us in the future. So Germany would be a very big market for us now. China would be a very big market for us going forward. And if you look at, um, we have talent importing markets and talent exporting markets. Because at, at the very foundation of our talent management system is our management training program. We bring about 1,000 graduates into our management training uh, program around the world. But we bring them in country by country. And in some markets, like in Argentina, or in Brazil, or in India, or in South Africa, they bring in 30 graduates every year. And they put them through a multifunctional two-year management training uh, program. And they, they are people who later, we have uh, uh, globally 1,500 expats. These companies that have very solid foundation and then very good management development in between, they tend to become talent exporters. So we have a disproportionate number of our expatriates that are from these uh, very strong management development, very strong local employer brand markets. Now there are some other markets that are very important for us that have been net importers of talent. So they have benefited from the talent development that has been done in Brazil and Argentina and so on. And those would include some very important markets for us like the US and China and Russia. And so if you take China as an example, one of the things, if I go back to 2004, we had let our management recruiting into our management training program drop to single digits. So believe it or not, in 2004 in China, we brought nine graduates into the company. Now Procter & Gamble, one of our major competitors, brought 100. Okay, So in 2005, we mandated that they were going to bring 70. In. We went from 9 to 70 to, you know, to look at. And what we had to do was we had to look at the whole mix. So if you looked at the, at the, the, the um, employment mix, how much do you pay? Do you pay at what percent, percentage? How many graduates do you bring in? How many expats do you send out? Um, you know, uh, what kind of benefits do you offer? Do you offer a pension or not? And so on. The whole mix. And if you laid that side by side, in China, and you compare Unilever and Procter and Nestle and Danone and so on, you could see that there wasn't much differentiation between those players in terms of what was being offered. And so if we're trying to build an employer brand in a market like China, you have to look at the whole mix and then decide how are we going to shift that mix in order to build a brand. Now, interestingly enough, in 2006, when we went out to hire 80 graduates, we had 25,000 applications in China. And so there, were, there was a lot of people wanting to come into, in, into the Unilever management uh, training program. But it's just the beginning. Right. You know, that's just the, and, and our turnover, you know, we were bringing mid-career, just to fill the holes of the people that were turning over in China, we were bringing 700 people a year into the company. Um, and if you look at our business in Brazil, it would be more like we might bring 50 or 60 people in, whereas in, in uh, China we're bringing 700. So it's quite different in different markets. So we worry. And then when you look at, take a market like India, which has always been a talent stronghold for us, the dynamic has shifted. What, Indian, what young Indians and Indian managers want versus what they used to want is changing. And so we, again, have to look at that mix and say, what is it that we're going to do in order sure. to, to maintain the kind of brand that we've had? Sure, and that makes sense to be locally sustainable in your, in your management development, in your talent development. Although at the same time, uh, you've probably benefited from having managers circulate the, the globe, as it were. I mean, from actually replanting managers from one region to the other, it, it probably creates uh, transmission of knowledge, uh, bonding, building of networks, and so on. How will you protect that, even while you're trying to build uh, competence and sustainability and talent development within a certain region, in a certain country? Uh, how do you maintain links across the different regions then, without that expat knowledge pool uh, circulating around? 
Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's, it, it's a great question. Because one of the, if you go back to China as an example, I mean, one of the really important things is if you bring someone in as a management trainee, once the person gets to about the, you know, there are critical points where these people tend to leave, two and a half years, five years. So pay can help you get them through the two and a half year home. But when you get to the five, five year home, they're looking to go ab abroad. And so an expatriation, but sooner. And so what, what I want to do is I want to expatriate people earlier in their career and, and create draw them the back. mixing mm -hmm. and then draw them back. Right. Mm -hmm. And then draw them back and send them out again and draw them back. And so someone might you know, be expatriated three times, but what I don't want is the career expat, the person who is born in the UK and bumps from Africa to Asia, from Asia back to Africa over a 25-year exp expat career, which we've tended to have a number of that. That doesn't help me in terms of building the global, uh, the global pool. So moving people around is still a critical part. Now the other thing that I want to do is I want the management trainees to be connected into a cohort. So if you take, you know, um, I want to look at that group of a thousand right, the as generation. belonging to the corporation mm -hmm. as a generation, and then I'm bringing them in in groups of 30 from different countries, having them meet the CEO, have them spend time with our senior management. You know, and these are fresh, fresh out uh, graduates, but I want to connect them to Unilever and connect them to each other in a global way. And so we've started to do that as well. Okay. And just to, to now sort of complete the circle, uh, on top of this, you're doing all of this. You're dealing with some of these issues of, of turnover and, and sustainability of talent, talent development. And at the same time, you're reducing autonomy. Locally, and this this is for some, right. you know, a contradiction. I mean, usually we give people more, more autonomy and independence and authority, uh, in order to generate that motivation locally and give them more things, more grist, uh, in order to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. But here, you're actually having to remove some of that. And how does it work? How do you actually implement this without having people uh, leave or, or uh, uh, become despondent, uh, turned off? Yeah. Well, there's no um, there's no hiding the fact that. In the past, when we had full kit, every function, general manager locally, and we had 200 of those companies around, around the world, that those people loved those jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, they loved them. Sure. Mm -hmm. They could control everything. They could deliver a result. The problem, of course, was that when that local autonomy met a big global competitor, the global competitor was winning. And so, we're trying to now, what, what we're offering people is more autonomy, but in a narrow, in, in a more narrow sense. So we're saying that if you are working on brand development in a global brand, we're going to give you a lot of space to build that global brand, but you're doing brand development, and then we've got to take that to market country by country. And when it comes to go to market, and when it comes to activating, a brand in a particular market. I mean, we've had some of the most incredible um, creative ideas. So if you take a global brand for us, a deodorant brand like Rexona, you know, the guys in, in uh, Europe used the World Cup as a way to activate. So they actually built a can that was like the, the, the soccer uh, the uniform, mm -hmm. the soccer uniform for each country. Mm -hmm. So you could get your to support the, the German football club, you could, you, you could get the, that, um, you know, in, 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 in the, the German colors. And same in Argentina and same in Brazil and, 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 and so on. And that was one, an idea that came from one particular market, figuring out how to activate the global brand. And then we were able to spread it across the world. So by having this mix of global and local, um, and, but your, to your point, there, there's no hiding from the fact that when you make the jobs more narrow, some people don't like it as much. But if you can give them, if you can ask them to be extraordinarily creative within the space that you're asking them, then you become more professional in those areas. And so we're trying to professionalize in more narrow areas, but give people more space in, in, in those. Did, did it boost the uh, sales of the cans that were dressed in the winning team's uh, huge shirts? Huge. <laughs> it was huge. It, it, it boosted the sales, winning and losing. <laughs> uh, I want to ask about the, uh, talk about the HR function. Now, okay. 
historically, uh, the HRF function is between a rock and a hard place. Mm. Um, historically, you know, you've been trying to represent the employees on the one hand, uh, help them, uh, but on the other hand, you have to represent the interests of the, the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always a tension between staff and line managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and HR sometimes gets shunted out of the way. You do the personnel sort of issues, but leave the, the tough strategic calls to us. How does it work uh, today at Unilever? Talk about the, 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 uh, the way that the HR function integrates itself uh, into the company and becomes a real player uh, amongst line managers, amongst the, the strategists of the organization. Well, I think that... Um one of the, the real um, gifts that I was given, you know, as I took on the role in, in Unilever is that the HR function has, has always had a seat at the table. And there has been a belief for a long time, long before I was a part of Unilever, that um, the, the people and organization was going to make it can make a big difference for, for, for the business. And so we're, we're blessed in many ways that we have a number of our HR people who are very well connected to the business. And the general managers rely on them. Um, they've got finance person on the right hand, the HR person on the left hand. So the finance, HR, and the general manager become the team for you know, um, the, the, the sort of the circle driving the agenda for, for the business. Um, and so we're, we're blessed in that, uh, in that sense. Now what we have been working to do is to take it from being, again, very local brands of HR, so it was highly dependent upon the skills of that particular individual and how connected that individual was to that general manager. And the function itself overall was lacking in some of the global professionalism that was required. So it's a bit like lawyers, you know, everybody hates lawyers, but they love their lawyer. <laughs> in, in HR, in Unilever, we had a bit of that. Everybody thought the function was, right. you know, sort of crappy, but, but you protect the your individuals own. were very good. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working to, to provide those great individuals with the sort of global systems, tools, and methods that would help us to, to be able to professionalize the, the, the function overall. And then the other thing that the CEO wanted was that you know, we discovered that we had different remuneration practices in every market. And so you have you know, people um, you know, really silly and in many cases very expensive things happening in the market depending upon how well they were doing in that market. And it, it wasn't doing much to um, build the Unilever brand. And so, you know, there is the, 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 the both sides of HR, sure. the protect dimension and the serve dimension, we needed to, to, to strengthen both, but in different ways. Sure, and it's, and it's a financial issue as well. I mean, HR sure. is also about uh, finding the right places to, to save money yeah. and finding the right ways to remunerate others so that it can create more value for the, uh, for the company. Yeah, when you think about it, I mean, the investments are huge. Gender diversity uh, is an issue that's, uh, that's spread out in, in different ways, uh, but globally. In different pockets of the world, I think, pay more attention to it than, than perhaps others. Um, what's happening at, uh, at Unilever? How important is this issue today and why? Well, um, you know, I, I, I think diversity, when you're trying to build global brands and build a global business, I mean, diversity is huge. It's just a huge issue. We are blessed in that, given all of our history of management, development, expatriation, and so on, we have a very diverse, ethnically diverse uh, management cadre. Um, but we are, like many other companies, uh, we fall short when it comes to gender diversity. So we only have one issue that we're focusing on when it comes to diversity, and that's gender. That's the only one. And you know, when we've looked at our, um, our population, um, it's not an, an issue of attracting women to Unilever because 50% of our frontline management are women. But then when you go to the next level of management, it, it's half. And when you go to the level above that, it's half again. And when you get to senior management, it's 6%. So when it, it drops from 50% to 6%. And so we, we think we have two issues. At, at the, in our more junior managers, it's stickiness. 
we haven't figured out, and we're working to figure out, what is it that we're going to do to make Unilever more sticky for young women? At the higher levels, it's that we just don't pick them. We don't put them in the jobs. And, um, and, and so we've decided that that one thing, putting them into jobs, is something we're going to pay attention to in a big way in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. And so we've launched something. We call it One More. And we issued at our leadership meeting an instruction to all of our top 100 executives saying, we expect you to put one woman, one more woman on your uh, leadership team in the next 18 months. And when we did, did this we, just, start? we just simply call it one more. When did this start? Well, <clears throat> the idea uh, started, the idea came to us in, in the summer of, uh, of this year. We've been trying all kinds of stuff uh, in and around diversity and running programs and, and in my view, all stuff that uh, wasn't going to move the needle. And so we said, we need a simple but profound idea that is going to reshape the numbers at the top. And so we think by adding 100 senior women to our senior management uh, teams, it's going to make a big difference. And so we launched it in November of this year. And I've fortunately, I've already had some uh, of these executives that have written me and said, check me off because I've already done it. And so uh, that, that's, that's what we're doing. And you're monitoring progress uh, of of these managers as they go through the system and um, how well they're doing, their support, and so on. Yeah, we um, you know the, the we know that um, you know we we haven't had um, a lot of failures in senior women, and so we know that once we give them the jobs, they do pretty well. We just haven't been giving them the jobs. And I think we have good um, flexibility programs and support systems and mentoring programs and you know, reciprocal mentoring and things like that. But my issue is that it hasn't moved the needle and I want to move the needle now. I also want to ask about your, your own personal career. Now, you have not had a life within Unilever. And I'm not sure if that's the norm, if most people actually rise up through Unilever or not. But certainly you've spent time in different places in the, in the Coast Guard. Uh, certainly, uh, you've spent about 10 years uh, of your life there in different capacities as a leader within that organization. Uh, at Motorola, you've spent a significant time, uh, and then at Unilever. Um, talk about some of the key transitions in your life as you've moved uh, through an organizational, well, uh, through a career ladder, let's say. What are some important moments in which you've gained uh, insight into leadership practice and you yourself have developed uh, leadership skills? What are some things that have helped you? Well, uh, the, I mean, as you said, the, my, uh, my career has had three pretty distinct phases. Coast Guard, consulting, where I spent 15 years and, and then working for two large corporations, both great companies, Motorola and, uh, and, and Unilever. So I feel fortunate in that, uh, in that regard. Um, the, the Coast Guard, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I went to the Coast Guard Academy to play football. <laughs> I didn't go there because I had a liking for the sea and its lore. They had a great football coach. I like to play football. Well, that's not a bad reason. And, you know, and, and I, I, went, is, uh, I went for that reason. Perfectly and then fine. once I got there, <clears throat> I fell in love with the mission. The life-saving mission of the Coast Guard really touched me. And I was, uh, I, I was fortunate in that I worked operationally. After I graduated from the academy, I worked operationally in Alaska. I worked operationally in, uh, in New England. And I had a chance to see the difference that leadership made in terms of whether you saved them or whether you didn't. And when the opportunity came up to, to go and be a part of the founding group at the, at the then uh, Coast Guard Leadership School, I jumped at the chance. And I had been operational, and then I was going into a staff position, creating this leadership school, and I just fell in love with the whole subject and idea. <clears throat> and um, while I was there, I went back to graduate school. And um, when it came time to go operational again, that was a key transition for me. And I said, you know, I think leadership's going to be my life, life's work. So I went and this, that was, point, this was at what age, roughly? Uh, I was 30. And 
uh, I, I then joined a consulting company in uh, the Center for Leadership Studies in, in California, San Diego. And um, I worked in various positions there. I ended up running that business. Then I took a, a, a risk when I was, I guess I was 35. I left the, the, the center and started my own firm with another guy. And one of these things, mortgaged the house, you know, put up the money. And uh, uh, so I was an entrepreneur. And I was doing consulting, but I was also running a consulting business. And we grew it. And then we sold it. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go through that uh, whole experience, and I certainly learned a lot from, you know, you, 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 it, it, when, you're, when your cash flow, when your sales are better than your cash flow, and you've got to meet the payroll, it's a, that's a challenge. Um, but I learned a lot from that about myself and, and, and so on. And, um, and then I was fortunate enough, you know, the first client that we had when we started our company was Motorola. And so I worked as a consultant to Motorola for, shoot, uh, probably seven or eight years before I actually joined the company. And the, the transition for me from consulting, I probably never would have left consulting, except that I had a, my, a, a tragedy in my personal life and that my first wife became ill and died about 10 years ago. And um, you know, I decided that this nomadic consultant life wasn't gonna work if I was going to start my life uh, again. And so I was talking to Motorola about a project when all this uh, was going on, and they said, hey, listen, if you're not going to consult anymore, why don't you come work for us? I said, doing what? And they said, HR. You, the stuff you do is kind of HR-related, leadership development, organization, effectiveness, you know, that kind of stuff. I said, well, gee, there's a lot of things about HR I don't know that much about. And what I find interesting and important about your story is that you did not come at it just as a functional specialist in, in HR and leadership, but you ran a company. Right. You had general management experience. Uh, you knew something about finance. You knew, you knew something about the operations side, uh, the marketing side, and so on. And this would probably give you a language to deal now with the other areas of the organization that, uh, that require you, that you have to work with. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a really good point. And you know, one of the things that I have tended to do is when I think about leadership, I talk about it in terms of leadership brand and leadership d demand, leadership supply and results and, and you know those kind of things because you're right. I mean, I started as an operator in the Coast Guard. I ran consulting um, organizations and so I know what it means to, uh, to make money, lose money. Uh, I know what all, what all that means. I know what it means to buy things and sell things. Uh, from a business point of view, albeit on a much different scale than, uh, than a company like Unilever. Um, and so I think that in, I do approach the HR job with, with somewhat of a different angle than some others. Do you think this is something the HR community lacks in the business world today? Do you think perhaps there's too much functional specialization and we need more broader uh, HR people? Uh, to interact more successfully in companies? Well, you know, one, one of the things that I, I say to, to any group of young HR people is you have to be able to present your proposition in the language of the business. And if you don't understand how the economics of the business work and, how the, and what are the economics of things like energy, what are the economics of things like talent? Because these seem kind of fuzzy, but by the way, at the end of the day, these are economic, uh, th there are economic factors, big ones. And so, you know, I, I think that, uh, that any, any HR person, and I, I send them regularly off to take uh, a finance series, regularly, to understand it. Go, and if, you don't, if you've never sold anything, Go work in one of our businesses and sell something. So you know what it means to sell, what you know what marketing is. Not from a theoretical point, you read the book. Go do it. Wonderful. Sandy, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Charlie. Great. <laughs>